Welcome. We are honored that you have decided to uh, join us as we dive into the dual nature of AI, specifically uh, how AI can help and hinder security efforts. My name is Steve Shear, and I have the privilege of leading our sales and marketing teams here at CCB Technology. Uh, before we do anything else, I want to be clear with intentions. So we don't come to these webinars with a buy now idea. I'm a sales guy. I'm telling you that up front because uh, I've been <clears throat> on the receiving end of a webinar and it's like, well, this is all leading to a sales pitch. No, it, that's not happening today. Uh, I'm not going to sell you anything at the end of the webinar. The call to actions are not that. This is a learn now. And if you're ever in a position to take action on things that you learn today, you'll know that we're here to serve you when the timing is right. So we're coming to this with the intention of bringing clarity to things that you're seeing swirling around and, and uh, hoping on our side, we're hoping to make sense of how it matters to your environment specifically. So this, this webinar, just as a little bit of a background, uh, came from feedback that we received from our Tech Strategy Summit back in September. So those of you that attended, you took a survey and you told us uh, that you wanted to hear more about AI and security risks and that kind of thing. So here we are. You asked and we responded. So that's a bit about our intent and who I am. The last thing I'll do before I uh, pass it over to Brett is briefly answering a question that we get sometimes, whether people speak it or not, they're wondering, who the heck are you guys again? Because I got the email, I'm here, but who are you? So CCB Technology is one of the top outsourced IT providers in the nation. Since 1991, we've been a premier source for hardware and software purchasing. And since 2011, customers have trusted us with ensuring their data is safe, being their 24 by 7 help desk, and advising on how to streamline processes by leveraging IT. Six times in a row, we've been in the top 250 of 30,000 IT providers, and we're very proud of that. But we don't talk about it enough, so that's why I'm saying it now. Execution is why we get awards. Trust is the foundation that we've built everything on. And our mission, as it says in the top there, is to help you accomplish your goals and dreams through technology. All right, grab a tissue, dab your tears from your eye after my mini Tony, Tony Robbins moment there. I get a little fired up. Uh, it's time for Brett to take over. <clears throat> so as questions come to mind, please put them in the chat. Uh, I'll be uh, fielding those at the end because you're going to have some questions as we go along with this. So with that, Brett, it's all yours, sir. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I just wanted to start off by letting people know, um, obviously I'm Brett Clifforth. I am one of the engineers over at CCB. And to give you a tiny bit of background, my, uh, my uh, compatriots over here at CCB in the engineering department lovingly refer to me as Brett GPT because I have a minor fascination that sometimes leads towards obsession into uh, security and AI together. So this is kind of... Um, one of my favorite topics that I could possibly talk about. So <laughs> I'm very excited to be talking to everyone about this today. Um, and uh, without further ado, I think we'll just hop right into it. So um, we could talk about this topic for hours and hours. Um, mainly when I sat down to try and think about what what areas I thought would be the most valuable to show people um, I came up with these three areas. This is not all encompassing and the information that I have for you guys is not um, a complete and total uh, game changing um, information dump for these three topics either. But I want to give you enough information to give you a better understanding of um, where these topics are currently, like I was like I said in my original video, and also where are um, these three areas going. Um, and the last disclaimer I will say is, uh, we can only predict what's going to happen in the future with security. We don't know for sure. Um, the best information that we have available is what we can go off of. And the information that I'm going to present here is based off of that best information. So I'm, I'm very excited to move forward. So I guess let's just start off with, um, the first topic that I have today, which is generative malware. So... Um, quick little background on malware and how, how does antivirus kind of 
you know, the general gist of how antivirus finds malware right now. So there's something called signatures. So signatures are applied to a specific type of malware when it has been seen and analyzed in an environment. And then that those signatures are kind of uploaded to databases for different antiviruses and different sort of security suites for um, future um uh, applications of that virus to be caught quicker. So it could be anything from like, these signatures could be anything from like code snippets to the, the, the actual physical code in the malware. It could be um, some of the behaviors that they uh, represent or uh, like, like for example, it could be um, like a specific ransomware encrypts files in a specific order that would be triggered and uh, and an antivirus may catch that a lot quicker than it would some new type of ransomware that hasn't been categorized yet or um, it contacts a specific command and control server that lives out in the threat actors environment and the antivirus or the security system is able to detect that signature um, uh, that has been seen before and catch that threat quicker than it would have if these signatures weren't initially stored. So the first modern use of um, malware is the polymorphic and hyper evasive viruses. It's two different types. And the first one I wanted to talk about is the polymorphic uh, malware. So essentially, what polymorphic malware does is it takes those signatures that antivirus looks for and every time the malware is downloaded onto a computer let's say through a phishing email or something like that you click on a link and uh, you download some sort of malware to get to your computer those signatures change so if an antivirus is looking for something specific um, like a file name or like some of the stuff that i i uh, talked about earlier um, it makes it a lot harder and it looks like a newer virus when it comes to antivirus or other security softwares. Um, anytime it spreads from one computer to another computer, it may change those signatures so that it makes it harder. Uh, let's say your AV catches a virus on one of your computers and it's, and it's something brand new. It may notice some signatures on that computer um, and then look into the rest of the environment for those signatures that might be prevalent or on, on some sort of like lateral movement from, which means from computer to computer uh, when a virus spreads in an environment. Um, but if that signature changes, then it, the uh, polymorphic malware or virus is um, much more successful in spreading without detection from, from computer to computer. Um, so, now that I've kind of explained that a little bit, um, the, oh, actually, I'm sorry. The, one of the important things to say about polymorphic uh, malware as well is it doesn't actually change the code of the malware itself. It only changes um, the, like the fingerprints that surround it, like the file name. Um, if it has multiple files, it'll change the order that they come in or the order that things happen, um, et cetera. Uh, it doesn't actually change the code itself. And oftentimes with polymorphic malware, it is the code itself is encrypted. So the antivirus software can't even read it while it's um, being transferred or, or uh, bypassed or anything. Um, so that's, that's another reason why polymorphic is used so much right now to try and get around antivirus. So on the defensive side for modern defense um, against polymorphics, uh, we use something called heuristic and behavioral analysis. So what that is, is um, instead of looking for the uh, literal the, the literal signatures that occur, because these signatures are constantly changing, we're looking more at the characteristics of the malware itself. So what what are the commonly associated behaviors that, that happen with these malwares? Um, so even if the code is changed or if the signature is changed or anything is changed, if they do the same thing, 
our heuristic and behavioral analysis can catch those and say, oh, this malware is doing something that we've seen before. It's likely a similar thing. It may be, it may have a similar end goal and we may be able to like proactively go ahead and try and defend against that. Um, and then there's something called uh, EDR, which is endpoint detection and response, which um, we employ at CCB, lots of places employ to classify these threats based on their behaviors and respond to them in real time. Um, a lot of times without any human inter interaction at all, it'll just decide, okay, we've rated this to be a um, major enough threat. We're going to stop it and quarantine or, or do whatever we need to do to stop the attack in real time. And those um, EDR and the heuristic and behavioral analysis, those are all run by AI in the background um, using machine learning and similar things. So when a lot of people think about AI um, going into the future, they think that it's, it's this brand new thing that hasn't been used for quite a while, but it it has really been in our security suites uh, kind of as far back as, as we can remember. Um, it's just becoming more modern and more usable uh, on both sides, which is one of the reasons why we're doing this presentation. So another thing that we do on the defensive side for the polymorphics is sandboxing. So essentially we, uh, we would have a secure or isolated environment where um, we are able to essentially watch with uh, a telescope and look at the behaviors that these um, um, viruses or malwares or whatever you want to call them um, come in and, and behave. So, when you click on a link in an email or if you open a file from a web browser or something, that file is taken into that secure area. It's launched and tested and monitored to see how it behaves. And then if it turns out that it's fine, then it is able to go and launch on your computer. Now this happens kind of in the blink of an eye for the, for the user side, but on the um, AV side, it grabs a whole bunch of data, and if it does find something that is um, uh, threatening or has malicious intent, it is able to take it and quarantine and get rid of it, and that's part of that EDR as well. Um, another thing it does for polymorphic is, is it, it simulates the circumstances that would cause the virus to spread, um, like providing... Um, another computer, like a virtual computer, um, like, hey, here's another target. Are you going to spread if we provide you with the means to spread? Or are you going to sit there dormant and, you know, try and prove to us that you're not actually threatening? Um, so that's that's kind of the basis of sandboxing. Now, in order to combat the heuristic analysis, the EDR and the sandboxing, um, Threat actors came out with hyper evasive malware. So you'll see a lot during this presentation. There's this kind of this cat and mouse. Um, I would consider us the cat. Maybe the, <laughs> the threat actor side would consider themselves the cat. But uh, and no matter what which side is the cat, there always is the mouse. So whenever someone makes an advancement, the other side has to come up with something to match or try and get a step ahead. So when we came up with these defensive tactics, they came out with hyper evasive malware. So what these what these malwares do is they look for signs of sandboxing and they alter their behavior so they're going to look does the computer i'm connected to have low ram does it have missing operating system files that are generally needed for um a, a normal physical user to be using their computer etc if they find that the environment is different we're just going to lay dormant. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to activate our malware. So we're not caught by the sandboxing environment. Um, they look for virtual environments. Is the processor or the memory that's being utilized by this computer, does it look like it's a physical, like, is there the signatures of physical hardware or does it look like it was virtualized with a virtual machine? If it is, we're going to shut down. We're going to hide our payload. We're not going to use our, our malware. So it makes it nearly impossible for um, our antivirus to actually learn and and utilize that information to protect against future attacks. Um, another thing that hyper invasive malware does is it it has process injection or hollowing. So 
essentially, it'll take a process that runs normally on your computer and it'll stop it and it will rename its malware and re-inject its code for the malware into that process so your computer thinks that it's running a specific process that is completely normal and uh, does not have that signature of... Um, or actually it almost has like a negative signature. Your computer, your antivirus looks at something and it goes, oh, that process is running. It's not really running at the right time or it may be running at the right time, but I know that process and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of up to the AV at that point to determine, is it doing what it's supposed to be doing or is it doing something else? Um, the real problem with that comes in when the um, malicious code is injected into a process that has elevated permissions. So um, a process that can make changes that, that are very detrimental to a computer. Um, that's one of the things that hyper-evasive malware does. Um, sleep timers. So de delayed activation. Um, let me throw a malware onto your computer and then I'm gonna tell it to just sit there for two weeks or something like that. And then hopefully the antivirus will have left it alone for enough time that when we activate the payload, the antivirus won't be quick enough or notice to be able to catch it. Um, and then lastly, they implemented user-like behavior. So let's wait for certain triggers. Let's wait for um, a certain program to open, or like I said before, the process to start for process injection. Let's wait until the user uses their mouse to click on their start button. Let's wait for something specific so that we can confuse the antivirus by including a payload in to a normal process and um, try and sneak in in an, in an area where the antivirus thinks everything is already safe. So that's kind of what hyper-evasive malware does. It really tries to mask itself as a normal process to get around the different... Uh, uh, heuristic analysis, sandboxing, um, and and uh, I have a bullet point for AI threat detection. It's basically all encompassing for these different things. But um, the good thing is most of this stuff, if not all of this stuff, is still catchable and preventable with behavioral analysis and machine learning models. So um, let's see here. Let's move over to, yes, thank you. So the adaptive code generation, um, this is the future. So it takes the um, polymorphic uh, code and essentially creates a real-time, um, a real-time generation that bypasses events as they're happening. So all of this other code that we've already talked about, um, it's kind of like if then statements. If this is happening, then do this. This is, I'm gonna look at your entire environment using artificial intelligence, and I'm gonna notice what hardware you have, um, what antivirus you're using, what, what multi-tiered defenses do you have, and I'm gonna generate malicious code that is made specifically for your environment. So what we need to do on the defensive side is use predictive models. We need to take viruses that we have known historically, put them into models, let them run wild and determine predictively what is this model going to, or what is this virus going to do if it's blocked here? Is it going to go this direction? What is this virus going to do if it's blocked over here? Is it going to go this other direction? And we just simulate millions of different avenues and then use that information to continue on and um, stop future attacks, essentially. And then we'll use uh, um, further honeypotting and things like that, where we're able to um, put out devices uh, for these new attacks that are coming in. We're going to leave them unprotected specifically to record information um, and then leave those honeypot devices off of our network so that there can be no transfer of uh, viruses from one computer to another. And then all of the analysis that's done from these different defenses are fed into AI systems for future learning, essentially. 
And then the last thing there, collaborative AI systems, we need multiple AI models to work together to enhance security. So right now it's, it's um, one AI model that's utilized for all different things. And in the future, we're gonna take detection, um, response analysis, we're gonna have different models for each of those things, um, essentially different programs even, and have them work together in order to create a faster response because each area is only working on one uh, part of the security um, interface, essentially. All right, let's move on. So this is a huge one. Uh, and I definitely wanted to include this because this is the one that is most uh, fascinating to me. So generative phishing and social engineering uh, the current modern use, generative generative text. Let's go use some sort of large language model to generate a phishing email in the style of somebody. Uh, let's take somebody's, let's, once we're in somebody's account, let's download all their emails, feed it into a model, and then make a specific model that can write an email that seems like them. Uh, and then one step farther, let's go on YouTube, download 30 seconds of audio from someone that we know, feed it into a machine learning system that takes the um uh the the data that that they've previously learned and the vocal input from that 30 second audio and create a perfect match of somebody's voice and i've done this i've just last week i showed one of my managers um i was able to take a 30 second audio from someone at ccb and um put it into the generative AI and I was able to create some very, very, very convincing audio samples. Um, so on the, on the, and obviously those can be used for like leaving voicemails. Hey, can you pay this client or something? Can you send me cash for an airplane ticket? Whatever you can think of, you can type and and those uh, audio deep fakes can be created. So on the modern defense side, just catch up on my notes here real quick. So AI detection tools, we're looking at um, sentence structure uh, as far as text goes. Sentence structure, context, word choice, phrasing patterns. Um, AI is able to take that those uh, generative texts and look at them and determine this person is using words they don't generally use. This person is using um, or typing sentences longer than they normally type. It's There's a thousand different things they can look at. And, and generative text is becoming easier and easier to um, spot, essentially. But with future advances, the models are going to have to get more and more advanced to keep up with it. Um, as far as the audio deepfakes go, we're going to have to look at, uh, or we currently look at tone, pitch, cadence, and um, very often there's artifacts. Um, one of the main things right now in modern day is AI really likes to insert ums and ahs into sentence. So it'll be like, um, yeah, and we need to go do this thing. Uh, and it's it sounds pretty unnatural, but other than that, things are sounding pretty good. Um, and then we're also using things like sentiment analysis. We're looking at chats and audio over time to determine uh, what is this person trying to get if they're sending multiple emails we're going to look and be able to determine uh, through ai models all of these texts seem to be um, a separate sentiment than this user is is normally talking about if it's someone that's normally calling and asking for products and then all of a sudden they call and ask for some sort of billing or trying to sell you something that's a different sentiment that they normally use and that can be flagged in the system um, and then uh, for email specifically, we do have uh, SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. So um, are we allowed to send from a specific area? Has the email changed in route? And what should we do if either of those things have been um, categorized? And then lastly, obviously, actual training to, to um, give your staff and people that you work with um, a proper chance against things like this, because this is one of the areas that is the hardest to defeat when it comes to um, attacks and threat actors. So future use, multimodal social engineering. 
It's a little bit scary. So essentially, not only will it be text and audio, but we are going to also add in video. Now, right now, video is not a problem. It's very easy to spot AI generated video. Um, things morph around. Everything's kind of wonky. The lips don't match up with the voices and everything. Um, but it is going to get better and it's going to get better very quickly and it will be a problem for a lot of businesses. Um, then all of that is going to be done through my bullet point there, the custom and improved generative models. Um, so what can we do in defense on those? So anomaly detection, we use behavioral analysis um, to look at any of those modalities of audio, text, or video for slight or overused inconsistencies. We look at, um, in video, pixel level changes. If, if, the, if your lips don't match perfectly, if the shadows are different, if the reflections aren't perfect, if there's background noise patterns or frequency ranges that aren't working properly, we can detect those. We now have uh, uh, people working on technology to determine heart rate and pulse detection through video. Um, which is absolutely crazy, but I've seen it in action, uh, very early stuff, and it does work very well to determine this person is alive and this person is generated by AI. Um, breathing patterns and, um, in the end, matching the metadata on the actual video. So whenever you take a video, audio, picture, anything, you're going to have those, um, there's going to be metadata in those things. Like, where was this shot, the location, what what was used to shoot it um, and other things similar to that. So let's say we have a video that says it was shot in the Caribbean, yet they're, the background of their video is, is them sitting in a winter pine forest or something similar. Those type of inconsistencies can be caught and used for determining whether something is generated by AI or not. Um, nextly is watermarking. So similar to DKIM, which is looking at an email, was this changed since it was sent? Um, we can create a digital signature or encrypted hash for some sort of video or audio sample that is embedded into the, to the uh, media. And then on the other side it is validated to make sure that nothing has been changed. Um, this could be visible or invisible. And it could also utilize blockchain to track uh, provenance. So, we can store timestamps on the video. We can store um, who created it, who modified it, like an entire history of modification and whatnot in an uneditable blockchain that can be stored and um, used for validation after some sort of media or phone call or Teams chat or anything like that is sent over. Um, and then non-tech verification, which is the thing that I'm trying to push on everybody <laughs> essentially right now. Um, come up with a process for in-person verification. Um, create some pre-arranged security codes. For example, if you have someone in your billing department um, that frequently calls you or works remote and is talking about um, calling for validation on payments for clients or, or bills or anything like that, have an, like a liter literal code word that needs to be stated or some sort of process or knowledge-based questioning um, that can be used that an AI is, it's impossible for them to know unless it's somehow leaked. Um, so right now that's basically the best thing, but as, as technology progresses, we will be able to determine things better. And then we can move along to vulnerability discovery and evasion. So, um, Modern uses, automated scanning. Um, for vulnerability discovery, we do, uh, we automatically probe, or I'm sorry, not we, they automatically probe systems to, to find vulnerabilities. So they send out this uh, software, usually an AI software that'll go out, it'll look for configuration issues, it'll look for weak points in your network, et cetera. It'll come back and it'll be like, hey, this is what I found. And then they can take um, they're the different uh, hacking tools or whatever you can think of and utilize those to go ahead and access your network or, you know, create havoc with malware and whatnot. Um, there's another thing called fuzzing where you can take random or unexpected inputs and just absolutely massively enter those into a, some sort of software system to try and discover vulnerabilities or bugs. 
um, and, and essentially try and crash them. Um, and then there's machine learning analysis, which takes the information from those automated scannings and those fuzzings to determine what um, the best avenues for attack on those specific targets are. Um, so on the defensive side, we have proactive scanning. So there are uh, people and companies that will do proactive scan scanning to scan your own network for vulnerabilities and fix them before they're taken advantage of. Um, we have behavioral analysis, which we've kind of talked about previously, where um, rather than looking for specific viruses, we look for the behavior of viruses that are causing an issue. And then we have NLP, which is um, natural language processing. And those detect vulnerabilities in the code itself and uh, textual data of the code. If, there, if there's um, any sort of inconsistency or, any, or anything in, in an application that it's, it has seen before, um, and there's any type of injection into a normal process or something like that, um, that would normally run a specific type of code. If any, any of that changes, then we know, and those things can be shut down. Um, so in the future, uh, we are, we're going to run into something called advanced adversarial AI. So right now, like I said, a little bit ago, they take the information from that machine learning and they look at their current products that they have. Um, and by products, I mean like malware or hacking tools or certain things, and they decide which ones are, are best to be used based on the information that they have. Advanced adversarial AI is a system all in one. It probes a network, figures out exactly what um, hardware, software, everything that you use. Um, it looks for vulnerabilities, and then it deploys its own purpose-built um, software or malware to uh, attack those specific vulnerabilities in your network. So it's it's basically this custom-built AI-driven um, vulnerability scanning tool that also um, uh, generates that malware and has specific tasks rather than trying to figure out, well, well, this tool, this tool may work for this specific spot, but not other spots. Um, and then there's automated zero days as well. So different hacking groups or different threat actors will share zero day discoveries instantly between themselves using AI tools. Um, essentially, the theme here is AI does things faster than humans can possibly do. And the more AI is integrated into the attacking or defensive side, um, the faster things get implemented or the faster advantages are taken. So if discoveries and, and zero day um, uh, attacks are shared instantly, and by the way, a zero day attack essentially just stands for a uh, malicious attack that is found or a um, vulnerability is found and a malware or something similar is created and utilized before the manufacturer or the software developer can patch or fix that vulnerability. So the faster that these different um, attacks are, are disseminated between um, all the different threat actors, the more widespread these zero day attacks are gonna be um, and, and the less time we have to patch things before uh, we can find them, which means on the defensive side, we need to improve our automated um, autonomous vulnerability scanning. So constantly having this vulnerability scanning going right now, it's kind of like a, a one shot thing. We're going to scan our network. We're going to go and do a penetration test or something similar to see if there's any vulnerabilities right now. And if we find them, we're going to patch them. In the future, it may be an automated process where we have an AI that's constantly looking at the network. If it discovers a vulnerability or something similar, it's going to be able to go and report that and get it to the manufacturers and everything and find a way to prevent um, those zero days from happening before they actually happen. Um, collaborative, sorry, collaborative AI defense. So... Using the same uh, methodology to defend against the zero days, we can now um, uh, expedite our autonomous systems to um, make the AI defensive systems faster and faster. 
Um, and then lastly, the advanced NLP and TI sharing. So again, NLP, natural language processing, um, the more attacks we see, the larger the database grows for attack defense um, generation, essentially. It's way easier to take information from attacks and use them to create new defenses than it is to come up with new attacks for people to try and evade. Um, it's kind of nice being on this side because we let them figure out sometimes what they what they're going to do next for the attacks and as soon as we see it we're able to grab that information and send it out to um every every defensive system on the planet essentially um so the more the more advanced uh processing and uh threat intelligence sorry that's what ti stands for threat intelligence sharing we have between companies um the faster the defenses go out to everybody. So I think you'll see in the future, there will be much less um, siloing of um, information on uh, threat intelligence and things like that between the different companies to um, help everybody figure things out much quicker. <laughs> um, and that's, that's basically everything I have here. I don't know how much where we're at as far as time goes, but I think it's a good spot, man, to uh, jump into Q and A. Um, <clears throat> uh, first, I'll, I'm going to selfishly take a second. So, a two part question for you, Brett. Mm -hmm. um, was it me that you took the audio sample? <laughs> and no, but I could do that for you if you'd like. <laughs> okay, so so my follow up question was: Are you open to me hiring you to generate some audio deep fakes? Because I, I would, I've got some ideas. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, uh, you just committed to it, and this is being recorded. So Morgan Freeman. <laughs> no, I'm legally bound, right? <laughs> Morgan Freeman's going to be telling me happy birthday, I think, in the future. Um, right. <laughs> so uh, we do have uh, one in the chat. If you if you have questions that have popped up, you can put them in the chat here. You can uh, send you know DM me directly if you'd like. Um, otherwise, we'll jump into this one that was in there from Mike, I believe. Uh, generated voices and ties to my joke. Uh, it could become difficult to even recognize it is happening to you. How? Are you, or how would you suggest uh, training people to recognize this so that they don't fall for it? That's so, uh, thanks for the question, Mike. I would say. Intune is a way to. <laughs> I would say it's going to, yeah, thanks Jacob. Uh, I would say it's going to be, it's going to be very hard to actually train um, somebody to recognize when a voice is AI generated. Um, like I said, there are some things right now that are noticeable when it comes to AI voice generation, like overuse of um and different like characteristics that or saying like, like I do all the time, uh, that AI thinks that humans say all the time. Those are going to be going away very quickly. So I think the number one thing that that needs to be trained into people is um coming up with processes for validation, in-person validation, um, and those security code words and stuff for the short time, uh, for the short term before we can catch up and come up with the devices that are widespread for, um, recognizing generated audio. Cause right now, um, even generated audio, I mean, it, it's only been like a week and a half that I've been able to copy someone's voice and have it very, very, very accurate. Um, so it's going to be a little while before there's actual uh, consumer-based um, softwares that will recognize it for you. So in the meantime, the main training I would say is to come up with those in-person processes. And you know, it, whoever you're working with for IT, if it's us at CCB, let us know. We can help you out with that potentially as well, just to make sure that the the systems that you have in place for billing and things where where money is being handled those are generally the things that are targeted the most by this kind of thing uh has some sort of validation that is non-technical right now because the technical side of things are catching up Good. um i don't know how directly or indirectly this covers i know it hits on the malware piece um but I want to throw it out there to you the question just came in when uh, when I create a backup of my computer, it often tells me that there's some missing files. How can we, how can this person uh, prevent malware use of those uh, or those files being misused, whether it's malware or otherwise? Let's see here.
So if you're if you're saying you're saying that you're preventing uh there's kind of two ways <laughs> that this could go. If you're insinuating that maybe malware had used or replaced those files, um and then your computer has to replace them, that is possible that or if you're saying um how can you prevent malware from stepping in where those files are missing? I would say the best thing is to make sure that you've got a proper antivirus that does um, that um, endpoint detection response that I was talking about earlier. Um, in order to prevent that sort of um, editing to your computer in real time, you do need to have some sort of machine learning or AI monitoring your computer for changes that aren't normally being made. Like I said earlier, the changing of file names, moving of files, deleting files, ch elevated privileges, um, creating new user accounts, anything like that, or changing processes. That type of thing is what could potentially cause you to have those missing files when you go to do your backups, et cetera. So um, really just making sure that you've got the tools installed on your computer and you're not just leaving it wide open for someone to mess with is the best advice that I can give right now. <laughs> and we do, to be very, to be clear, this is something that we specifically, I'm not sure who it was that, that said it, but anyway, for everyone, this is something specifically that we do at CCB um, on the preventative side, um, like, mm -hmm. like um, Brett was talking about. Um, any other questions before we uh, jump to the next part? Um, you can throw them in there now. If you do get a question after, um, oh yeah, good follow up there. If you do have questions from here, uh, we're not going anywhere. We're going to make sure that you get your questions answered. Um, so we are going to, <clears throat> excuse me, start to wrap this thing up. At the beginning, I mentioned to you uh, a non-sale call to action. Um, and right before we get into that, this is a, a short video that will help you know what we're aiming at in our call to action today, because it is different than like trying to sell you something. So we're going to watch this two minute video and then we'll wrap this thing up. Manage your endpoints, your devices, specifically, though, not just computers, but we can also manage iOS, Android, uh, mobile devices as well. So one of the big differences when we talk about device management is on-prem in, in an office situation like this. We've always talked about managing things with group policy. And so that requires your, your server on-prem. And then within that, you have your computer that you connect to, your laptop, and it talks to the server and gets group policy, gets all of the things that are pushed to it. The problem is, is that when you now leave the environment, right, and you are at home, the only way to go back and talk to that server is to have a VPN connection to connect to there. So one of the big things that we can introduce with Intune is the ability to do that from a cloud platform. So now, in the same way that when you connect to the cloud, no matter where you are, uh, if you have an internet connection, essentially you can connect to the cloud. You can get your Teams content, you can get your email, you can get anything with inside of the 365 suite, right? Intune is a component of that Microsoft 365 stack in the cloud that allows us to manage those endpoints. We can now push policy in the same way to those endpoints. We can store and manage all of that in Intune in the cloud. It also gives us the ability from a security and compliance standpoint to do auditing. So we can take audits on these devices now and say, hey, when is the last time that this device was patched? When is the last time that it got Windows updates? It then, again, gives us that ability to walk through and do the same type of thing for uh, cell phones. So we can set policies that say, hey, in order to access our email, you have to have the latest version or one version back of iOS. So that gives us the ability in a way that we haven't had on-prem to also then control our devices, control our information, and make sure that everything is locked down accordingly. So the call to action is this, and then I'll explain why we showed you that video. The call to action is this, you letting us know if you want information about one or multiple things that we have gotten feedback on, which is now on the screen. Uh, these are three topics that are hot, not just right now, but right now specifically with people that we interact with, whether they're prospects or customers or attendees of our recent events. These, just like today's webinar, come from feedback that we've received. We're not coming up with this on our own. So we're responding with three tell me more email lists. In the chat, there will be a link 
but most will probably already have scanned the QR code by, by now. If you haven't, go ahead and do that now and I'll keep explaining what's going on. All you have to do is select whatever of the three you want to know more about and we'll take care of the rest. Each list, tell me more, email list, will include exclusive content like the video that Jacob of Jacob talking about Intune. That's a two minute portion of a larger five minute video. So each of these lists will include exclusive content like that. Tutorials, walkthroughs, release dates on products. You in those tell me more lists will get the release dates on products such as AI Consulting, uh, Intune, and Azure products. And then discounting as available to those specific topics that you select. This is not a broadcast email. We're bringing you what you say you need to know more about. This is one way that we at CCB bring value to you as a true IT partner. So click the link in the chat, or utilize the QR code, tell us which one uh, is of interest to you or all of them. And thank you for being with us. A recording of today's webinar and the links to the waiting list will be in your inbox soon. Talk to you very soon down the line.